You can't keep getting away with it! Well, Bleach did it again. I guess the first part of the Thousand Year Blood War was not a fluke as Studio Puro continues to knock it out of the park. You're saying I get another 13 episodes of practically nothing but fight scenes with a ton of abilities we've never seen before and even some that weren't even in the manga? <laughs> I guess I'll watch. Our boy Greg is up to his usual antics, but this time he has recruited Sasuke, formerly of the Hidden Leaf, to become a successor. Instead of just invading normally this time, he reveals he's got a goddamn shadow city he's just been hiding in the shadows. And from this point on, we get like 23 and a half fight scenes that are just as good, if not better than part one. Obligatory spoiler warning, since part two is like 90% fights, we will, in fact, be talking about the fights. The first episode is probably the only time where we get a chance to breathe and kind of assess all the stuff that's taking place. As I mentioned, Greg is planning his next attack on the Soul Society and names Ishida as his successor. Everyone's pissed, this dude gets cut in half from the power of cleavage and Ishida drinks blood. All incredibly normal occurrences. So suck your dick, uh, blood. At the same time, Ichigo, Renji, Rukia, and Byakuya are finishing the recovery at the Squad Zero barracks. Renji and Rukia are standing still, Byakuya has been in the bath for about four episodes, and Ichibei is making Ichigo complete a sobriety test by walking in a straight line. We got Urahara and Mayuri doing some obviously sketchy shit, and Chad and Inoue are still vibing in Hueco Mundo with what we assume is the goat grim job. I know this like whole Shadow City thing isn't exactly ideal for the Soul Reapers, but it looks pretty sick. The contrast between like this ice reishi buildings and the red sky is a perfect backdrop for the darker aesthetic that we've seen this arc. I know the Quincy's orders were to annihilate the enemy instantly, but the Soul Reapers ain't gonna go down without a fight. Sure, they may have lost the first battle by 50 points like the Broncos and be at a disadvantage yet again, but I'm expecting a comeback. Wow, look at that cool sports reference. You should totally follow me for sports related things. That was sports. Of course, before fighting can actually begin, you have to show up directly in front of your enemy for the mandatory shit-talking session, and no one is better at talking shit than Mayuri. This dude pop out the lab with the Snuggie as bright as the sun, but more importantly, Nemu. Our first actual fights are Toshiro versus Busby? Baz? Basby? You know, I'm just gonna keep it a buck. Terrible at remembering most of the Quincy names, so I'm just gonna nickname them. Toshiro vs. Fingerman and Soifan vs. Robot Gun. Now, visually, the fights still look sick, but low key, Toshiro and Soifan got their ass beat. Oh, damn. This to me just seemed like a transitional fight used to set up the distribution of the hollowed Bankai pills. Naturally, we transition to someone who we have not seen use Bankai yet Shinji. Now, while it looks dope, can we just talk about how unnecessarily hard his music is? Or it gets this like clean ass lo-fi hip hop track with the shamisen and flute as he casually makes people murder their comrades, and then he gets this like baby making R&B when he uses his shikai. As is stated by the other Quincy's, Bambi is stupid, so she just blows everything up around her as a means to counter Shinji. This causes the goat, or rather the dog, the dog Sajin, to show back up. Now this fight right here, hit different. From an emotional standpoint, this might be the most impactful of the series so far. Sajin took the death of Yamamoto especially hard and was going to do whatever it took for revenge. He sacrificed his heart for the Jinka technique to gain temporary immortality in a means to take revenge, which is the very thing that he had tried to stop Tosin from doing. At the end of it, he lost all that was human about him and became nothing more than a beast. He wanted nothing more than to knock the stupid mustache clean off this fuck's face, but even as a vessel with no heart, he still stepped in to save his comrades. I was already feeling down for my boy, but then hearing Iba reiterating shit like, you haven't done anything wrong while carrying his limp body, that hit me harder than I expected. There was something else along with the emotion that made this fight fantastic, and this one might surprise you, the CGI. Why would you say something so controversial yet so brave? Try recalling a time you watched a scene and thought, yeah, the CGI really makes this better. This was that exact moment for me. Even how it was presented initially was very clever, showcasing the normal looking Kokujo Tengi Myo and then breaking off into the Dangai Joe. This thing? 
is fucking terrifying. What are you supposed to do when something that's hundreds of feet tall starts sprinting at you and you hear this sound? Its face is terrifying, the sounds it makes are terrifying, it's pure intimidation. The CGI just gave it this otherworldly presence. It is a power that looks worthy of staking your life on it. I already thought the CGI used in Thousand Year Blood War was pretty solid, but this shit was actual nightmare fuel in the best way possible. The next fight was by far the longest we've had so far. There's so much stuff that happens in the span of like one and a half episodes. But first thing I gotta mention, alright? I am getting sick and tired of Ikaku and Yumichika being stupid and getting their ass beat. That's stupid! You're stupid! Stop being stupid! They are much stronger than what we've gotten to see in this arc, so I'm hoping they don't get beat again without at least trying. Nacho Libre is both a really cool and really eh enemy. Fighting style and moves used are top tier, but the character itself, pretty annoying to me. And then you add in James, who is just like the amalgamation of an annoying sports fan, makes the dialogue of this fight probably my least favorite. I didn't think I would be excited to see a strange, bald baby man get killed multiple times, but eh, here we are. Gamers! As I said though, the fight itself is insane, and the concept of a superstar getting buffed by a fan is actually quite unique. After a couple of our gamers get gamed upon, we get to see Rose and Kensei spring into action. I was happy to see these two. Of the captains, we've probably seen them in action the least since they weren't in most of the original anime what did he say? due to their holification. I'm pretty sure we got to see Kensei's Bankai, but I could be completely wrong. I've been known to be uh, an idiot in the past. I like how his is more of a physical-based hand-to-hand combat Bankai, and he matches up well against... You know, I was going to look up a wrestler, but turns out there was literally a masked superstar. Perhaps that's who this was based off of. Unfortunately, Kensei is a victim of the you-can-do-it buff and receives the flying knee of all time. Rose might have had the most unexpected moment for me in part two. And what do you know, it was with another CGI Bankai. Obviously, he manipulates music, but I thought the concept of the three programs with the finale being a hero's life was cool as hell. But unfortunately, Rose suffers from a different disease, and that is I must tell the enemy what my power does before I've defeated them. And it turns out behind that mask, the dude is actually kind of smart and ruptures his eardrums to stop the sound. Oh, you're dead? Oh, okay, well, you have yourself a blessed day. Okay, you too. You must. Then, kind of just blast my man with the star hyper beam? That kind of went hard, not gonna lie. Just when you think the Quincy's have won this battle, the boy, the legend, Renji drops in, absolutely dripped the fuck out. As soon as I saw the fit, I knew there was no chance that this dude was losing. Just look at how unconcerned he is even when the enemy is punching him through fucking buildings. We do not care. The snakehead Bankai reveal through the smoke was clean AF, even though I personally do not like snakes. If this man is getting his equivalent of Ichigo's theme during this fight, you know that that enemy is screwed. And again, just so unconcerned, disintegrates this man. I'm not sure if it's just me, but seeing the Zaga Teppo reminded me a lot of Rengoku's Rengoku ability in Demon Slayer. I figured everyone who went up to Squad Zero would be stronger, but this is pretty ridiculous seeing how two captains and three other strong squad members were already defeated. At this point, Ichigo finishes his training and leaves the Royal Palace, and we are reaffirmed that Mr. Greg is in fact not a chill dude. Well, I see with a magnificent pair of bananas. Oh, great heavens! If you lose as a Quincy, you just get murked and your powers are absorbed. Then we swap our focus to Rukia, who encounters Asnote after transferring Rose and Kensei for medical care. Asnote is 100% my favorite Quincy we've interacted with. The dude just emanates creepiness, and the goat Yoshi Matsuoka fucking killed the voice acting performance. <laughs> Oh, oh, scary! Oh, 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 shiver my timbers! The range of characters this man can pull off is honestly remarkable. The concept of fear as a weapon is done so well, and it's probably one of the only times I've actually enjoyed when someone explained the basis of their power. Basically, as long as you're alive, fear will always have an effect. Too bad Rukia hits him with the Kyrie yeah, Irving, I'm revealing dead. that the true version of her Zanpakuto essentially kills her. Rukia has in fact become too cold, making her incapable of feeling fear. G kinda. <gasps> 
Oh, this scene was absolutely fantastic, and the visuals alone are better than 99% of what you see in actual horror animes. Asnote has experienced all forms of fear, pain, and suffering in his past life, but now that that suffering is gone, the only thing he fears is being rebuked by his majesty. The amount of tonal changes in his voice, plus like the added elements of body horror made this even more memorable of a fight. The cuts to silence, the wall of eyes, the swarm of flies, leading into a truly perilous scream from Rukia, it is fucking fantastic. Thankfully, big bro Byakia is there to assist and remove any fear that Rukia may have had remaining in her heart. Realizing that Asnote's power is an actual manifestation of his own fear, Rukia is able to use her Bankai for the first time. You know if that outro song starts playing in your fight, it's gonna be filth. The shit's like a goddamn ice nuke, and the form she takes is beautiful. Dear God, it's beautiful. Being able to remove that lingering fear and increase her bond with Byakuya, while also having one of the biggest power glow ups and using it against an actual interesting Quincy, made this one of the most memorable fights in all of Bleach for me. Now if you thought we were going to go through part 2 without a little bit of Kenpachi action, you were surely mistaken. Of course it was cool to see Yachiro use her Shikai for what I believe was the first time, but the hype for Kenpachi is insane. What this man had to go through, killing Unohana to unlock his full potential, we finally get to see it on display. Are you crying? Am I crying? No, I'm not crying. You're crying. And of course, in typical Kenpachi fashion, he faces the most fucking busted, stupid Quincy in existence. The power to make anything you imagine into reality is, in theory, unbeatable. But if anyone was to beat the unbeatable, it'd be Kenpachi. I don't know if Grammy is just stupid, but his imagination kind of sucks. If I was him, I'd just be like, hey, I imagine you're dead, and then poof. Yo, holy shit, he dead! My first reaction would not be to immediately go and summon the MLG gun green screen. He kept summoning dumb things, and eventually Kenpachi got him to question his own imagination. That makes him create an even more stupid and busted power, creating a second version of himself and thus doubling the power of his imagination, unlocking the move Death 2 Electric Boogle. This move is in the form of a meteor. Now, I was expecting Kenpachi to remedy this somehow, but the dude literally cuts a fucking meteor in half with only his Shikai and his eye patch still on. That's why he's the GOAT! The GOAT! It's gotta be one of the coolest animation sequences we've seen in Bleach so far. Gremi virtually kills himself when trying to imagine that he's stronger than Kenpachi, and then just makes a bunch of excuses. Yeah. Kenpachi is pretty much the definition of an anomaly, but your power is the most busted of busted. You lost cause you're dumb. So dumb it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb! I am quite curious as to where Yashiru went off to. Perhaps she felt that Kenpachi won't need her anymore because of his newly discovered power, but you can tell immediately how worried he appears, especially given how injured he is. Seems only natural after cutting a meteor in half and being sent into deep space that Kenpachi would be attacked by four more people. Get him up, let him get up, let him get up, let him get up. <laughs> Thankfully, our boy Ichigo decides to finally make an appearance. And like, I thought Renji looked unbothered while fighting. Dude hits him with the boom, bam, bop, bada bop, boom, pow. Nah, if you unleash a powerful attack and the only thing the enemy does is smile at you, you know you fucked up. Personally, I wouldn't take that kind of disrespect, but when Ichigo releases a Getsuga Juji show, creating an explosion as big as that meteor with virtually no effort, most people are gonna lose. The thing I remembered most about this fight wasn't even anything to do with Ichigo, it's the fact that they used the most goofy ah sound effects for Gigi's little skeleton dudes. We're talking the stock Hanna-Barbara run and zip sound effects. I lost all composure watching this, but that kind of strange comedic relief was actually welcomed. So no head? Of course, another four or so Quincy's want a piece of that Ichigo ass, but the gang steps in and allows him to pursue Greg. This is where we have our fated encounter. Naruto sees Sasuke, but is a member of the Akatsuki. Truly tragic. Chad also shows up looking drippy and in a way is pulling off her best tier Hari Bell cosplay. That outfit simply cannot be combat efficient. So now, no sooner than leaving the Royal Palace, Ichigo has to, in fact, go back to the Royal Palace. Oh, look! Ikaku and Yumichika. Certainly they'll redeem themselves and use their full power. I'm hoping they don't get beat again without at least trying. I like to call this next battle, How Fucked Up is Fucked Up. That's fucked up. And that's fucked up. And, um, 
Fucked up. The battle between Mayuri and Gigi at who is the best at performing unethical experiments. Well, I was honestly more sad to see how Gigi's zombies reacted. I honestly kind of felt bad for Bambi. No one comes close to creating shit as effective as Mayuri. Dude is also unmatched when it comes to shit talking. Also, I was pleasantly surprised to see Charlotte make a return. I don't know if I'm in the minority here, but I really enjoyed the first encounter they had with Yumichika. The fight itself isn't super notable, but the most thought-provoking thing is the fact that not only Toshiro, but Kensei, Rose, and Rangiku are turned into zombies. I know Gigi said that they can do this to Soul Reapers before they die, but I'm not like 100% sure if they're all actually dead. Dremi said that he killed Kensei and Rose when they were getting treatment, but I, I don't know, I can't really be sure. I'm sure Mayuri does some weird Houdini shit and they'll be fine. Okay, so they're not fine, but they're more fine since they aren't under Gigi's control anymore? Yeah, I don't know, the rest wasn't super interesting. Byakuya bodies people and there's Pepe the baby. Weird ass character, but it's got a banging soundtrack. <laughs> the final few episodes of part 2 had to be my favorite. I was incredibly hyped to see Squad Zero in action, because it's said they're stronger than all 13 court squads combined. We do get some interesting and strange flashbacks involving Osho and Greg, and all I really got out of it was that these two got eyes where they shouldn't have eyes, and that the Soul King is Greg's father? You're not my dad! I guess he's just pissed at what the Soul King has become or something, and that's why he's targeting the Royal Palace. And I'll go ahead and say this now, I have no idea why Kirio is the one making all the food, because Senjumaru did nothing but cook for these final few episodes. She's so smug and passive aggressive, easily becoming one of my favorite characters in this new arc. Some of the first encounters are just testing either side's strengths, she absolutely mercs double tongue Dimmy over here before taking a 50 cal to the head and being squashed by a Final Fantasy mage. My neck! My back! My neck and my back! That is a pretty damn gruesome exchange, but of course it is but a ruse to trap everyone in the cage. Once the actual royal palace is safe and secure, the rest of Squad Zero can start contributing, specifically Etsu. While he's doing that, Greg manages to use an ender pearl to escape the womb and confront Ichibe. Or perhaps I should not say his name so lightly, you know, maybe we'll just give him, give him a little nickname. We'll go with Bob Ross, you know, less hair, but he do be painting. God, I love cocaine. How can this man simultaneously look like the least threatening and most threatening person in the show? These two battles go on side by side, and honestly was starting to look bad for Squad Zero, but Discount Aizen has to go ahead and describe his power exactly, allowing Etsu to create a method to counter it. Tenjiro bodies Hoshvalth, Senjumaru calls Ishida a bitch, and Bob Ross be slapping Greg silly. Now obviously Greg has some countermeasures, mainly sacrificing a majority of his comrades so their powers can be distributed to his royal guard. I'm not sure why so many Quincy's were surprised by this, he's never actually shown that he really cares about any of them, and they just follow him blindly because of the power they've received doesn't seem that out of the ordinary that he would take all that power back eventually and redistribute it. You Batman! You very, very Batman! But perhaps that just shows that Greg is a master of manipulation, but also that the Quincy's are dumb as fuck. They should have known if they weren't standing on that stage back in the first episode that they weren't really that important. This makes these select few Quincy's significantly stronger and they're able to put up a good fight against Squad Zero. Since they are all actually too strong, their lives are linked together, so killing themselves breaks the seal and allows some of their true power to be revealed. And oh boy, I have never felt so privileged to be an anime only consumer than this moment. My time has come. Cause we get an anime only Bankai from Senjumaru and it's filthy. I don't know the translation, and in fact, the name is long as hell, but to me it seemed as like a thread prison or the threads of fate. Each person succumbing to a different prison before being sealed off for eternity. Perhaps this was something Kubo wanted to do originally, but I am very glad we got to see it now. I also know there were a few other moments in part 2 that were anime only, but this was the only one I knew specifically. However, as dope as this Bankai was, I can't see it working, at least for every Quincy member. I doubt Ishida dies right here, and Hoshvalt hasn't really shown much of any power, but as a Bankai itself, very sick. Just as cool is Ichimanji used by Bob Ross. Ichimanji. Lord have mercy, I'm about to bust! Controlling black allows him to overwrite the name of anything that is covered. 
and anything without a name has no power in this world. This gotta be one of the most disrespectful things I've seen. Completely eliminates Greg's name and then gives him a new name of Black Ant. That thing fucking sucks! And effectively squashes him just like one. Again, I can't see this being the end and the way Osho looks at the seal makes me think he's gonna let his guard down and remove it, allowing for a counterattack. And that's the end of part two. We do get a four to five minute summary from Khan of some of the major events so far, but I didn't really watch any of it. We're already condensing a lot of the content, which I do think helps the show, but I think if we were able to extend those fights in this episode by like another four or so minutes, it would have been a perfect end to part two. Part three is scheduled for sometime in 2024. My guess would be either in spring or summer. I'm assuming we'll get to see some true powers of the Quincy's revealed with a lot more of Ichigo and Ishida. Just like part one, I don't really have any major criticisms for the Thousand Year Blood War. Its dark themes and serious nature have continued to impress and seeing a bunch of abilities for the first time is gonna make any Bleach fan happy. The animation is still god tier and the music somehow is even better. Maybe the fights could have been a little bit longer to learn a little bit more about the characters kind of establish that connection or maybe those characters just didn't matter and that's why they were fast now while i think the initial invasion of the quincy's had more of an impact and the plot was better explained you're looking at a difference of 0.2 on mal Pierrot is putting out their best animation to date and kubo is making sure that his work finishes how he truly wants it to this was a bit of a long-winded video but as most of part two was fight scenes and showcasing of new abilities i figured we should at least talk about my initial reactions if you had a chance to watch thousand year blood war part two let me know what you thought about it in the comments if you enjoyed this video be sure to leave a like and subscribe i want to thank little pk peppy jewel nicholas gutierrez tech rob shaky pants and chupa for their continued support that's all for this one hope to see you here again